Hey there, Orioles fans. Today is Friday, June 17th, 2022, and welcome back in to the Locked on Orioles podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. As always, I'm your host, Connor Newcomb, and coming up on today's episode, we've got a whole lot of fun to get to here on the pod. We start with a very fun Orioles win on Thursday afternoon in Toronto. They beat the Blue Jays 10-2 to to split the four-game series, ran all over our former friend Kevin Gosman, and I'll get you the five things you need to know from that one. Then, a little bit of a concerning roster move for the Orioles, as Bruce Zimmerman, who was the Orioles' ace over the first month and a half of this season, has been optioned to AAA. We'll talk about why the O's did that and what the future holds for Zimmerman. And then the Orioles made a waiver claim earlier this week as well. Jonathan Arauz was claimed from the Boston Red Sox. We'll talk about how he could fit in to the Baltimore Orioles. But that's all coming up on this jam-packed Friday episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast. You are Locked On Orioles, your daily Baltimore Orioles podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. So we got a whole lot to get to here today. Fun Friday show coming up here on the pod to get you to the weekend. And let's jump right in because the Orioles played, I would say, a top five most complete game for the O's all season in their 10-2 victory over the Blue Jays on Thursday afternoon. It was getaway day in Toronto. Orioles win the game. And listen, they end up splitting the four-game series, two games apiece in Toronto against one of the best teams in Major League Baseball. You take that as a huge win for the Orioles. Get two out of four on the road against the Blue Jays. It, it was pretty impressive. This was the Orioles' largest win against the Blue Jays. The first time they've won by at least eight runs against Toronto since 2015. So a, a nice little stat there. For Baltimore. And this one was a whole lot of fun as the 10 to 2 win gets the Orioles to 28 and 37 on the season. Here's a stat for you the Orioles were 28 and 62 last season. They are 28 and 37 this season. Yeah, they're better here in 2022. But I'm going to get you the five things you need to know from the Orioles 10 to 2 win over the Blue Jays. And the first thing you need to know is that the O's offense, frankly, just beat up one of our old friends. Yes, it was the first time that Kevin Gosman had ever pitched against the Baltimore Orioles. Of course, we've seen Gosman for a long time in an Oriole uniform since he was, you know, just a, a young lad back in 2013 and 14, helping the O's out of the bullpen win that division, then becoming the ace of the staff at one point. You know, you can argue in 2016, he was the best Orioles starting pitcher at one point, you know, started the final game of the year in 16 in Yankee Stadium, the win that got the Orioles into the wild card game and, and pitched better and then was, you know, one of the guys who got traded at the 2018 deadline as the Orioles shipped him over to Atlanta actually getting Bruce Zimmerman back in that deal. Of course, a guy we'll talk about later in this episode. But he struggled in Atlanta. He struggled in Cincinnati. But Gosman found a home with the San Francisco Giants last year, was a Cy Young contender, signed a big deal with the Blue Jays this offseason, been a Cy Young contender so far this year. But he did not look like one against the O's offense on Thursday. Gosman lasts just two and a third. Orioles get him for seven runs, five of them earned on seven hits three Ks and one walk, and they did it without hitting a home run. And Gosman only threw 53 pitches, but the Orioles just jumped on him the entire time. They got a run in the top of the first inning as Cedric Mullen started the game with a single. They got first and third with one out. Adley Rutschman hits a ground ball to the left side, but beats it out, stays out of the double play, brings home the run to make it one nothing. And Gosman settles back in. He gets a one, two, three second. But then the O's just jump on him in the third inning, the Orioles put up six runs in that third inning, chasing Kevin Gosman from the game. It was the fourth time that the Orioles have scored six runs in an inning this year. That is their season high. They have not scored seven or more runs in any inning, but they just came up to the plate and started going. You know, Cedric Mullins had a bloop single to start the inning. And then, you know, after Austin Hayes was retired, you get a Mount Castle single, you get an Adley Rutschman double, you get Rugno Dodor with a sack fly, you get a Tyler Nevin double in an RBI, a Ryan McKenna RBI double, you had a Jorge Mateo RBI single in there. And, you know, the Orioles mashed some of these baseballs in that third inning as well. They sent 11 to the plate, scoring six runs, and again, knocking Gosman out of the game. And 
it was just fun to watch everybody in the lineup contribute against the old friend Kevin Gosman. And is this the second time the O's have done this to an old friend? Remember, they scored nine runs against Dylan Bundy when he started for the Twins against the O's a couple months ago. I was in the ballpark for that one. Now they beat up on Kevin Gosman as well. Orioles are liking when they're facing an old friend. Second thing you need to know in this one is that the other starting pitcher was pretty great, and that was Tyler Wells for the Orioles, who I think has firmly cemented himself as the best starter in the Orioles rotation at the moment. I don't even think you can argue it's anyone else. It is Tyler Wells right now. He goes six innings for the third time in his last four starts. Wells in this one allowed one run on five hits over six innings, three strikeouts, just one walk, which has become his calling card. The only run he allowed in this one was a solo home run in the game hit by Teoscar Hernandez in the bottom of the fourth inning, got the Blue Jays on the board, made a 7-1 game, and he hit that ball hard, but that was it. Wells throws 86 pitches in six innings, and yes, you know, the Blue Jays did square him up a little bit. I'm not going to deny that. They had 11 hard hit balls in six innings against Wells, but he limited the damage, and he got a couple of good defensive plays by Mateo and Nevin in the game, but at the end of the day, you know, the Blue Jays are going to hit you hard. That lineup's too good, and yeah, you'd like for less than 11 hard hit balls, But if you can get through six innings allowing just one run against this Toronto lineup, you don't really care how you do it. And Tyler Wells was just fantastic again. And, you know, he's not getting big swings and misses. He's not getting big time strikeout numbers. But what he's doing is throwing strikes, not walking anybody. You know, once again, one walk in six innings. That's basically been what Wells has done all year. And he just pounds the strike zone. He gets ahead of guys if they don't jump on him on the first pitch. And listen. He only had eight whiffs on 45 swings. It's not a very good number. He's not going to be a big-time strikeout pitcher for now. Maybe as he continues to develop as a starter in the majors, the strikeouts will come. That's what we hope. But right now, he's an efficient guy who gets you five or six strong innings, doesn't walk anybody, throws strikes. And at this point in the Orioles' rotation, with Means injured and Rodriguez injured and Bruce Zimmerman just being ineffective and now being in AAA, the Orioles having more questions now in the rotation – You just need Tyler Wells out there every fifth day. And, of course, in his last start, he stopped the Orioles' stretch of nine straight games without a quality start. He comes back and and gives them their best start since then. It's just been fun to watch. And, you know, what was really fun for Wells is is the slider has been kind of the best swing and miss pitch all year. But he only got one whiff on that slider. The pitch that really impressed me today was the changeup. It was his third most used pitch. It was 36 fastballs, 20 sliders. 19 changeups and 10 curveballs on the day. But of those 19 changeups, he got four whiffs. That was his leading pitch in terms of whiffs on the day. He was pounding the zone with his fastball, sitting 94, 96 all day. Velo was a little up. And that changeup was especially good against Vladimir Guerrero Jr. All the way back early in the game, in the first inning, he strikes him out on back to back, just deadly changeups down and in to Vladdy. Just so impressed by what Tyler Wells is doing right now for the Orioles. Third thing you need to know from this 10 to 2 win as we go back to the offense is this was an important day for Ryan McKenna, who was a part of that big six run third. He had an RBI double in it. And just for McKenna to get a two hit day has got to be huge for his confidence right now. He goes two for five with a double and RBI a run score. Now he did strike out twice and he only had one hard hit ball, but he got the start in this game and really. You know, a spot opened up for Ryan McKenna this week because Anthony Santander on the restricted list, unvaccinated, can't play in Toronto. Orioles called up Kyle Stowers to make his major league debut, but Stowers only started two of the four games. And I think some of that reason is the Orioles obviously wanted to get a a little look at Stowers, but they also wanted to use this time without Santander to get a further look at Ryan McKenna, who really hasn't been able to play regularly because Hayes, Mullins, and Santander are so set in the Orioles outfield. So with Santander out for four days, Ryan McKenna started three of the four games this week for the Orioles. And listen, he did not look great in his first couple of starts, but to get the two hits in this one, starting in left field, also gets the RBI double. Listen, he's hitting 238 now on the season, a 617 OPS. I think, you know, we've all decided that Ryan McKenna is probably at best a a fourth outfielder in Major League Baseball. And that's the role he's playing right now for the Orioles. And he's good at that role because he's good defensively. He's fast. He can be a pinch runner, steal a base. And he can hit a little bit when you give him regular at-bats like we saw on Thursday. But I think it was just big for him to get those two hits, show he's still got that bat, and he can still step in, you know, to give somebody an off day or if there's an injury. Because as we know, 
Santander and Hayes both have been, fingers crossed, kind of injury prone in their career. And neither of them have really had an injury so far this year. But it's nice that we, you know, can see that, hey, if McKenna does have to step in for an extended time, he can still swing the bat up there like he did for basically all of his time in the minors with the Orioles. Fourth thing you need to know, we will stick in the outfield. How about Cedric Mullins? You know, a lot of Orioles had hits in this one. Orioles scored 10 runs on 13 hits in the game. You know, you had Ryan Mountcastle have a multi-hit day, Rugnet Odor, and Ryan McKenna. But Cedric Mullins led the team in hits. He was three for five on the day with three singles, two runs scored, did have a strikeout. But Mullins singled in each of his first three at-bats in this one. Started the day three for three, was retired in his last two ABs. But Cedric Mullins quietly is turning back into the hitter we saw in 2021. Mullins is now hitting 298 in June. Yeah, that's uh, that's pretty exciting because you know his overall average is now up to 250 on the season, but he's been hitting right around 300 in all of June. Of course, you know last weekend I should say he had that 4 for 6 game, now he has the 3 for 5 game. You know, he's had hits in 7 of his last 8 games. It's starting to come together for Mullins. And the extra base hits are coming. And yeah, on Thursday, all three hits were singles, but two of those balls were scorched. The swing looks a lot better. It seems to have less of a kind of a loop, less of a hole in it that we saw at times early this year. And that bodes so, so well for the Orioles as he gets his bat back. And then the fifth and final thing that you need to know from this one is that, listen, you know, kudos to the Oriole bullpen for not really letting the Blue Jays sniff their way back into this. And part of that was that the O's did add on. You know, they took the 7-0 lead in the third inning. Then offense went a little quiet, but they turned it back around. They got two runs in the seventh. They got an Austin Hayes solo homer in the eighth, his ninth of the year, made it a 10-1 game. But the bullpen came in and did its job. Now, you know, let's uh, let's take a moment for Nick Vespi's perfect ERA on the season. Remember, Vespi had not allowed a run all year in AAA. He hadn't allowed a run in the big leagues. But Nick Vespi allows one run on one hit over an inning in the third, although he did strike out two in this one. It looked pretty good pitching in the seventh and the eighth. Gave up a one-out double in the eighth inning. Uh, came out of the game. Austin Voth came in and gave up an RBI single. But Voth ended up getting two outs. No runs charged to him. And then Rico Garcia pitched a scoreless ninth to close it out. He was the other guy who uh, was added this week, replacing Keegan Aiken for the week on the roster. And uh, nice to see the bullpen just come in and, and not make it difficult. And you know, we saw the Oriole bullpen make it difficult Sunday in Kansas City when the Orioles built the huge early lead against the Royals and had to win that game 10-7 with the tying run at the plate in the ninth inning. That was not the case here in Thursday's game. And shout out to those guys. And listen, you know, we know Brandon Hyde said Rico Garcia along with Kyle Stowers, they're going right back to AAA Norfolk here on Friday as Santander and Aiken will rejoin the team in Baltimore. And Austin Voth may not be long for this bullpen, but it was nice to see those two guys get out. And of course, you know, we hadn't seen Nick Vespi in almost a week. So uh, it was nice to see him pitch as well. But really overall, great game for the Orioles. They win it 10-2. to two, And really proud of this team for splitting the four-game series in Toronto. But, you know, that wasn't the only big news of Thursday for the Orioles. I would say maybe even the bigger news than a comfortable win was the roster move that the Orioles made before the game. And they brought up Mike Bauman, and that was nice to see Bauman back in the bigs. But obviously, the reason Bauman came up is because Bruce Zimmerman went down. He was the Oriole ace for the first six weeks of this season. What happened and what led us to him being in AAA? We'll talk about that coming up here in just a second. But first, our next partner has a product I use literally every day. That's Athletic Greens. And I started taking AG1 from Athletic Greens because I want a better gut health, more energy for this podcast, and an optimized immune system as well. But you may be asking, what is this stuff? Well, with one delicious scoop of AG1, you're absorbing 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens to help you start your day right. Special blend of ingredients supports your gut health, your nervous system, your immune system, energy, focus, recovery, aging, just helps your body. And it's lifestyle friendly. Any diet you can incorporate it into. It costs you less than $3 a day as well. You're investing in all-in-one nutritional insurance. And Athletic Greens is a climate-neutral certified company 
as well. So you can feel good about what you're putting in your body. And you can also feel good about the company you're buying this from. And so right now, it's time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition. It's just one scoop in a cup of water every day. That's it. No need for a million different pills and supplements to look out for your health. And to make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash MLB network. Again, that is athleticgreens.com slash MLB network. Take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. So the Orioles win it 10-2 to two over the Blue Jays and split that four-game series in Toronto. But before the game on Thursday, before the afternoon game where the Orioles won it 10-2, to two, they made a roster move, which was in some ways surprising and concerning, and in other ways not really surprising at all. And the move was the Orioles optioned left-hander Bruce Zimmerman down to AAA and called up right-hander Mike Bauman to replace him on the Oriole pitching staff. And, you know, if we said to you a month ago that Bruce Zimmerman would be pitching in AAA in mid-June, you would have called me crazy, and I wouldn't have blamed you. But things have gotten kind of dire for Zimmerman, and... This almost became the only thing the Orioles could do, unfortunately, is send Bruce Zimmerman down to AAA. So how do we get here? Well, Zimmerman stats right now. He just made his 13th start of the season last night, or I should say Wednesday night, excuse me, in Toronto. And in his 13 starts, it's a 5.94 ERA. In 66 and two-thirds innings, he's allowed a league-high 87 hits. He does have 46 strikeouts, not a great number, only 11 walks. It's one of the lowest walk rates in baseball, but he's allowed a league high 18 home runs and his 5.86 FIP with a 5.94 ERA tells you he's not getting unlucky or anything when he gives up these runs. But the question becomes, well, Connor, you talked about him being the ace of this staff early in the season and you compared him to John Means. And I'll bring out my own receipts. Connor, you did an episode where you thought Bruce Zimmerman was the next John Means and could, if he made some adjustments, even be better than Means. Yeah, I did. And I believe that. And I still believe that could maybe happen. But he's taken a nosedive this season. Bruce Zimmerman's first seven starts, he was an ace, plain and simple. In his first seven starts, a 2.72 ERA in that time in 36 innings, 32 Ks, just nine walks. He allowed just three home runs in those first seven starts. He was dealing. Bruce Zimmerman's last six starts, basically a tale of two seasons, first seven starts, last six. His last six starts, 9.79 ERA, 30 and a third innings. He's allowed 52 hits. That's almost two hits an inning. Now, he's only struck out 14 batters in those 30 and a third innings. Here's the weird part. He's only walked two batters in his last six starts. So he's throwing strikes, maybe too many strikes. He's also allowed 15 home runs in 30 innings over his last six starts. He's allowing a home run every other inning. That is ridiculous. And opponents hit 377 against Zimmerman in his last six starts. So as we know, those are terrible numbers. And watching it, it was pretty terrible too. Now, the context here is obviously, well, Bruce Zimmerman made a change. When things started going downhill, those first three starts of the last six, Bruce basically thought that he was tipping his pitches. And Andy Koska wrote a good story about this in the Baltimore Sun last week, that Zimmerman thought he was tipping when he was in the set position. He would come set on the rubber, and if there was a runner on second, you know, he would just have his glove kind of right at his belt, and his hand was showing. And I think he thought the runner on second or the runners on base could see the grip in his glove of what pitch he was throwing. And so he made an adjustment. So he debuted the new adjustment in his start against Cleveland. That was a couple of weeks ago. That was at home. And he basically moved his hands back to his back hip with the glove covering his entire hand. So nobody can see into his glove at any time for what pitch grip he has. But it's only gotten worse in terms of the stats since then. Now, Listen, he's working on something different. The new set position changes his delivery, changes his mechanics a little bit because it's something different than he's been doing, you know, most of his professional career. So it's going to be a bumpy road. There's going to be, you know, a learning curve for Bruce. 
But his last three starts have been bad, bad, bad. He gave up six runs on 11 hits Wednesday night in Toronto. That's kind of been the norm, what we've seen over his last couple of starts. And he's had those change mechanics for each of his last three starts versus Cleveland in Kansas City and in Toronto. And it's just been bad. And the Orioles option him. And Brandon Hyde basically said, you know, to the media on Thursday that he wants Bruce Zimmerman to just work on things at AAA. And what the Orioles most likely want him to do is just have a space in AAA Norfolk where he doesn't even have to pitch in games that often. He'll probably pitch once a week for a couple weeks in Norfolk. You know, they play the six game weeks, Tuesday through Sunday. They're off every Monday. He'll probably pitch once a week. That's it. And in his side sessions, he'll have more space and time to spread out the appearances in Norfolk and work on this new delivery, these new mechanics, this new set position. Because clearly, although those starts before he switched were not good and he thought he was tipping his pitches, it got worse when he made the change. And again, you're going to have some growing pains when you're switching up mechanics. But he needed a place to work on it. And it's tough to work on mechanics in big league games in the AL East. That becomes very hard. So because Zimmerman obviously still has options, this just his third year in the big leagues, I don't like that it happened, but I think it was probably the smart move for the Orioles to send him down to AAA. Now, I don't think for a second Bruce is going to be you know in AAA for a month, like that we're not going to see him till after the All-Star break or something. But I could see him going down for a couple weeks. I don't think he'll be back up in June. Obviously, he has to stay down for 15 days anyway, so that takes us to the end of June. So now that I think about it, you know, maybe it's the rest of the first half of the season, and maybe we see him back, you know, maybe the first start after the All-Star break, first game back, we see Bruce Zimmerman. That would be right around July 22nd, right around there, so just over a month. Maybe he spends just over a month in AAA working on those mechanics. It could just be two weeks, and he's back, you know, right at that 15-day mark, he comes back to the bigs. I could see that as well. But he certainly needs to work on those mechanics. That changeup that was so dominant for Bruce early in the year, the strikeout pitch, he could throw it in any count to any hitter. They were just sitting on that pitch because they knew it was his pitch and he wasn't commanding it well. His fastball has been a disaster all year. It's gotten worse. It was a little more promising what we saw in Toronto Wednesday night just because he threw more changeups and they were a little more effective. But he certainly has things to work on. And you know it's going to be at least 15 days, maybe more, that he's going to work on these things down in AAA. So in terms of who replaces him, you know, obviously Mike Bauman comes up to the big leagues. He's going to work out of the bullpen like he has all year. Bauman's made six appearances in the bigs this year, 11 innings, has a 491 ERA, 11 hits, six runs, eight Ks, six walks, and a homer in those 11 innings. He's actually had an interesting season where Bauman has been way better in the majors than he's been at AAA this year. It's been kind of odd for Mike Bauman. A lot of that has to do with the back and forth. You know, he's been called up and sent down already three times this year, but in 16 and a third innings in AAA, he has a 7-7-1 ERA, but he has a 4-9-1 ERA in the bigs, which has been interesting, but Bauman will work out of the bullpen. There's a potential he could get a start, but Brandon Hyde did say he, he's not ready to commit on which starter will replace Zimmerman for the time being. Now, what's lucky for the Orioles is they have the off day on Monday. They host Tampa this weekend, then they're off Monday, then they have the two at home against the Nationals. And what the Monday off day allows them to do is you can basically skip Zimmerman's spot in the rotation, and for the next go-around, you can go with four guys in the rotation. So the O's don't have to commit to a guy to replace Zimmerman really until next weekend uh, when they go back on the road. So that is at least a positive here that they don't have to make that decision right now. But just a really tough spot to see your guy who was the ace early in the year have this much go wrong, leaving so many pitches over the plate. I mean, 15 homers in his last six starts. <sighs> it's it's gotten tough to watch. And I, I still believe in Bruce. I think if he figures out these mechanics and he can get that change up back, which we saw a little bit, he got it back a little bit, I will say, against Toronto on Wednesday night, got the change up back a little bit. If he can still believe in the slider and the curveball, just throw less fastballs. He threw a lot more sinkers on Wednesday night. Maybe he goes to that pitch more. I still believe in him. I still think he can be the pitcher we saw early this year. Do I still think he's going to be better than John Means? No, I don't. But I still think he can be something for the Orioles. He just has to work on this, and you just kind of have to send him down to AAA to give him that time and space to do so. But just unfortunate that this is how this season has gone after such a great start for Bruce Zimmerman. But as the O's add Bruce to AAA, 
they added another player to the AAA roster. That was Jonathan Arauz, who is an infielder who the Orioles claimed off waivers from the Red Sox. Now, they sent him down to AAA immediately, but he is on the 40-man roster, and he could factor into the Orioles' infield situation later this year. So coming up next, we'll talk about Arauz's career so far, what he could bring to the O's, and who got taken off the 40-man roster to make room for him. But first, let's talk about betonline.net, your one-stop shop for all of your sports betting needs. It's your number one source for all your betting stats and your sports info. You can find all the latest sports developments, news and odds, including the NBA Finals. Now, I'm recording this before Game 6 is over, so you could be saying, kind of, the Finals are over, the Warriors won, or you could be saying, let's get those odds for Game 7 in Oakland on Sunday night. Either way, as I'm talking, NBA Finals still going on. Stanley Cup Finals. Colorado takes a 1-0 lead. Andre Burakovsky with the OT winner on Wednesday night against the Lightning. Get all the odds there. Of course, Major League Baseball right in the middle of the season. And all the latest fighting news from MMA and UFC to boxing. BetOnline is your continued source for all your sporting wagering information, including live betting, esports, and more. So head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and the action at BetOnline, where the game starts. So the Orioles won 10-2 on Thursday but they sent Bruce Zimmerman down to AAA. But they were also active on Wednesday when, of course, they lost in the walk-off to the Blue Jays. They also made a roster move early in the day on Wednesday, which I mentioned briefly back on Thursday's episode. Wanted to get to it a little more in-depth here to end today's Friday pod. And that is, the O's made another waiver claim, and it's another infield waiver claim. Mike Elias has claimed a lot of infielders off waivers since he took over as Orioles GM before the 2019 season, and add, and add Jonathan Arauz as another guy to that list. So first of all, just a little background on who Arauz is. He's still 23 years old, which is probably one of the big reasons why the Orioles clamped him. But he was DFA'd by the Red Sox earlier this week, and the Orioles made the claim and got him on Wednesday. Again, a 23-year-old infielder who has played shortstop, third base, and second base in his big league career, played most of his innings at second, just over 200 innings there, about 120 innings at shortstop, and 35 innings at third base in the major leagues. But he is 23 years old, a switch hitter, who the Orioles claimed him and then immediately sent him to AAA Norfolk, which is where he will start out. He spent most of the year in AAA with the Red Sox this season, only played in six games for the Sox this year at the big league level, and did not record a hit was 0 for 10 with three strikeouts and an RBI at the big league level. And his AAA stats, well, at least offensively, they were not much better. 24 games in AAA with the Red Sox in 99 plate appearances, hitting 185 with a 242 on base, 239 slugging, five doubles but no home runs in that time. And basically how he profiles is not a big power hitter, but a switch hitting infielder who can play all three infield positions and is is pretty much a plus defender at third, at short, and at second. He gives you that switch hitting, which you like, and he has been a better right-handed hitter, so he can turn into kind of a lefty masher at times during his career. In his MLB career, he's hitting just 180 from the left side of the plate, but he's hitting 241 from the right side of the plate. Now, I will say he has four big league homers, and all of them have come from the left side of the plate, so his power comes from over there but the average comes against left-handed pitchers as a right-handed batter. But although Arauz only played in six games this year with the Red Sox, he's played in a few more over the last two years with Boston. Now, the Red Sox picked him up prior to the 2020 season in the Rule 5 draft, drafted him in the Rule 5 draft from the Houston Astros system and brought him in. He played 25 games in 2020. It actually hit pretty well. 80 plate appearances, hit 250 for Boston, and was kind of a nice reserve infielder. They brought him back on the team in 2021, but just couldn't hit. 28 games, 75 plate appearances, had just a 185 average, did hit three homers last year, but spent a good chunk of the year in AAA with Boston and was not on their playoff roster last year. And that's been the same thing this year. 0 for 10 in the big, six games most of the year in AAA. And listen, not a great hitter in his big league career, just a 60 OPS plus in his big league career. But you're asking, okay, Connor, after all that, well, why the Orioles claim it? Well, one, he's 23 years old. And when you're 23 years old, 
you still got a lot of baseball ahead of you, and maybe they see something there. B, he's an infielder, and the Orioles still need infielders, and they just need some depth in the minor leagues as well. That's why they sent him right to AAA. He still has options, which is why you claim him, and you can send him to AAA. He's a switch hitter. Those are always nice to have. And uh, I think the obvious thing, Mike Elias knows a little bit about him because he spent 2016 through 2019 in the Houston Astros system as Arius was actually originally signed by the Philadelphia Phillies out of Panama in 2014, but he was part of that 2015 trade that saw Ken Giles go to Philadelphia. Arius is one of the guys who went back to Houston. Thomas Eshelman, former Oriole and former podcast guest, was also one of the guys who went from Philly to Houston in that trade as well. And for four years, he was in the Astros system, had a pretty solid year offensively in AA in 2019. Astros didn't protect him from the Rule 5 draft. Red Sox scooped him up and have kept him since then. And again, you know, he's not a free agent until 2027. So if the Orioles find something here, they obviously have a lot of control on him. He, he still has options. But at the end of the day, just kind of a depth move. Again, solid defense, switch hitter, has options, plays the infield. And Mike Elias knows him, you know. He was, they were in Houston together for three years from 2016 to 2018. So I'm sure him and his guys have an even further scouting report on the player they think Jonathan Arius can potentially be. Cause again, still only 23 years old, but he'll start at AAA Norfolk, you know, unsure of how many at bats he's going to end up getting. Obviously, the Tides now have Jordan Westberg and Gunnar Henderson up in AAA. You combine that with Taron Vavra and Rylan Bannon both being on that roster, all four guys who are top 30 prospects in the Orioles system. They're not going to want to take away at-bats from those guys to give them to Jonathan Arauz. You still have a guy like Pat Dorian is kind of going back and forth from AAA and AA. So we'll see where he fits in. Maybe the O's want to try him in the outfield. That's the potential because he already has good defensive versatility, but probably just a depth move for the O's, but he is on the 40 man roster. So they definitely have at least some plans for him. And I could see him getting to the big leagues at some point. I wouldn't say it's probable, but I could definitely see him at least getting a chance to get back to the bigs now with the Orioles. But you know, he, he got added to the 40 man roster because he was claimed on waivers and the Orioles had a full 40 man roster. So they had to make a move. And I think they made the move that all of us saw coming as the Orioles DFA would Zach Lowther on Wednesday to make room for our And Listen, this is a move the O's had to make. It was kind of the next guy that was going to get DFA'd. I mean, in AAA this year for Zach Lowther, 10 appearances, 9 starts, had a 10.03 ERA. In 35 innings, he allowed 37 hits, did strike out 39, but walked 18, and opponents in AAA hit 361 against Lowther this season. And it was all topped off by his worst start of his professional career on Tuesday night. And the next morning, he was DFA'd. He allowed 10 earned runs in three and a third innings for Norfolk on Tuesday night. And that was kind of the last draw. Now, if you remember a couple of weeks ago, he came up and got one big league appearance this year, gave up five runs over five and a third in relief. It was really bad early, kind of settled in late, but still wasn't good. He had some really promising starts last year, made his major league debut late in 2020, had three three solid starts in September for the Orioles last year, but he just lost something. I don't know if it was, you know, his command has gotten significantly worse this year. He's been a big command pitcher as kind of a soft tossing lefty throughout his career, but he was so good in the lower minors. He was frankly pretty dominant in double-A buoy in 2019 and, and, you know, didn't have great numbers in the minors last year, but had some good starts in the majors, but it just all fell apart on Zach Lowther. And I still stick to my guns. My point I made a couple weeks ago when he came up to the bigs for one day, the Orioles needed to give him one more chance in the big leagues, even though he was bad at AAA, just to see because he has been a top 30 prospect for the O's and he was a third round draft pick back in 2017. It didn't work out. He gave him more chances at AAA. It didn't work out. And listen, this doesn't mean this is the end of his reign with the Orioles organization. It could be. They could end up releasing him. But also, I can't imagine another team is going to claim someone on waivers who spent 99% of the year in AAA and has a 10 ERA there. I would bet that no one's claiming him to put them on their 40-man roster. I would bet he probably passes through waivers. 
And I would think he just stays in Norfolk with the Orioles, but is just no longer on the 40-man roster. And the O's should get a chance to continue to work with Lowther and try and figure out what gave him success earlier in his minor league career and what the heck has happened here in 2022. But it just stinks to see it. He's, you know, I've heard from multiple people in the organization. He's one of the best guys, just one of the best people in this Orioles organization. Even, you know, interns and and you know clubbies that have worked with him that you know are not even you know big time staffers have told me that he he's one of the best guys to to work with to be teammates with to just interact with in the O system and I feel for him because you know he was never going to be a major league ace we never saw that for Zach Lowther but I think a lot of people thought he could at least contribute at the big league level for the Orioles I thought that too and he was doing that at the end of last year but he just lost something this year that he's never been able to get back and it's June and he can't find it it's only getting worse and so I just, I feel for Zach Lowther. I hope the Orioles, you know, again, I think he's going to pass through waivers. I think he'll stay in AAA with the O's. I hope they can figure something out. Maybe they put him on kind of the Phantom IL to work on some things. If he does leave the organization, I wish him all the best with another team. But I hope the O's can try to figure something out. It's just been rough for Lowther. And it's it, it, it basically it's just stunk to, to see this happen to uh, Zach Lowther. He's been a great pitcher in the O's system and, and, and has been a great person. Uh, to have around the system as well. But in terms of the major league level, Orioles back in action tonight. Flo Rida is going to be in the house at Oriole Park. He's doing a concert after the game. But the game itself is the Orioles and the Tampa Bay Rays as Tampa is back in town. Last time they were here, Adley Rutschman debuted, and the Orioles took two of three in a wild series with Tampa. Well, tonight, it's a 6.05 start. Dean Kramer and Shane Boz will face off. Boz just his second start of the year after coming back from injury. Got lit up in his first one. We'll see if the O's can do the same. And Kramer's been looking solid recently. Rays come in at 35 and 27. That was coming into play on Thursday. As I record, they are leading the Yankees 1-0 in the fifth, trying to avoid a sweep at Yankee Stadium. But it'll be 6 o'clock tonight. 4 o'clock on Saturday, Jeffrey Springs versus Kyle Bradish, And 135 on Sunday, Corey Kluber versus Jordan Lyles, Orioles, and Rays. And then I'll be back with you here on Monday on the pod, recapping the entire weekend of Orioles baseball, giving you my three big takeaways from the O's series against the Rays. Hopefully, they can get another series win against Tampa Bay. But uh, you'll get my thoughts on if they did that and what the O's did this weekend when I return with you here on the podcast on Monday. But until then, I'm Connor Newcomb, and this has been the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day.